hearty welcome to second day of three day international webinar on impact of physics in healthcare let us invoke god's blessings for us our cosmic father bless each one of us who have gathered here fill all our minds with your enthusiasm wisdom and help us to understand everything and transform each one of us to become great contributors to this society with this short prayer i welcome you all to this webinar dreams is not what you see in sleep dreams is a thing which doesn't let you sleep department of physics maristella college vijayawada fondly remembers and dedicates the second day of three day international webinar on impact of physics in healthcare towards celebrating each moment of apj abdul kalam sir's life on his birth anniversary day that is today india can never forget his indelible contribution towards national development be it as a scientist and as the president of india as his life journey gives strength to millions dr apj abdul kalam sir's birthday is being celebrated as world students day learning gives creativity creativity leads to thinking thinking provides knowledge knowledge makes you great life and time are the world's best teachers life teaches us to make good use of time and time teaches us the value of life if four things are followed having a great aim acquiring knowledge hard work and perseverance then anything can be achieved on this world's students day let us remember shining stars of today one child one teacher one book and one pen can change the world let us pick up our books and pencils they are our most powerful weapon such inspiring words coming from malala no one is too small to make a difference everyone can do something if everyone did something then huge differences can happen team environmental is greater than birds promising words the power is within you youth on such a significant day we are happy to introduce another eminent youth who is doing his post doctoral fellowship in germany amidst us he is dr rajkumar we are really happy to have a youth to address our gathering on this significant day i invite dr sharan to present his bio data to the gathering namaste it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker dr rajkumar udgori dr rajkumar udgori is an enthusiastic active and renowned resource person in the field of innovation he has been a post doctoral fellow from university of frankfurt germany he has received his doctorate degree from university of frankfurt our speaker has an outstanding research experience as a research assistant guest scientist in germany he obtained his masters degree in biotechnology from the university of gaisen germany he earned many academic honors like post doctoral fellowship els bronner frenicius stephen and many more to his credit dr rajkumar utgori has published many research papers in leading international journals like iovs facet journal journal of neurochem etc and presented his research work in berlin usa and stockholm dr rajkumar is a member of federation of european neuroscience societies fellow of indian society of applied biotechnology member of indus india foundation on the top of everything our esteemed speaker is the founder of 
the Chamberlain Student Society, and publisher of the book, The Biobricks. We also organized many international conferences on bio-industry interactions. He has not only been a great academician, but also an active sportsman. He excelled in various sports and games and won many prizes. In a nutshell, our speaker is a young, dynamic, inspiring, electrifying role model to all the younger generation to promote and to exchange cutting edge ideas in an effort to foster fruitful research networking amongst educational community. I welcome you, sir, virtually to our meet on behalf of Maristella College, Vijaywada. Thank you, sir. Now, I hand over the session to our honorable speaker, Dr. Rajkumar Kuchpuri. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody from my side, and uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. And it's a, a great honor that I'm presenting on the Students Day, and uh, I'm happy that uh, this is my second webinar that I'm presenting uh, side of Maristella College. And once again, I think uh, I take this opportunity and try to share some knowledge what I have for the students uh, with respect to the physics in biology and also in instrumentation as a career. Uh, so I would like to tell you that uh, I'm not an expert in physics, so I would, I'm mostly trying to share the applications and depending upon the interest of the students, you know, so you have to later try to uh, just figure out what your interests are and then you can in detail study all, uh, study the different instrumentation or the mechanisms or the subjects, what uh, I'm presenting about this. Uh, and I think these your physics faculties are uh, better than me so they would be explaining more principles and then uh, uh, about the physics aspects in the biology what i am bringing to you so that you know you'll be very clear and you don't need to hear something from me about physics so and also you know i just wanted to provide uh, give the small disclaimer that uh, some of the information uh, or about in my talk would be my opinions and they need not be strictly uh, accepted and other thing is uh, i try to provide maximum information in the in the presentation and please check the links for any further clarification about the information I have taken utmost care in uh, providing the information. And in case if there is any change of the information, I'm not responsible. And that's the reason I'm advising everybody to check the links if you are interested. And also, it's important that I want to mention that I'm not associated with any company mentioned over here, and, I, and I'm not supporting anything. This is just a small drop of information I have taken from the, uh, from the ocean. So I might be missing something. And uh, any link is purely coincidental. And I would be, main, uh, especially tomorrow, I think I'd be discussing about few instruments and uh, I'm not prescribing them to use. And whatever the device, anything what I'm mentioning, uh, please, if you really are interested in that, they have to be only used under supervision and try to uh, uh, take prescriptions of them. And I'm not responsible for any other inappropriate use of the same. Okay, so having said that, uh, what I would be, uh, as I already told you, I would be talking some very fundamentals, uh, and then um, I would be talking about physics and biology, uh, some interesting bio research topics. Uh, so you know, physics is a vast area. So what I have done is, from each uh, basic concepts of the physics, I have explained you uh, some applications how they are used in the biology. Um, so maybe you know, in each of the application, I will I would be talking about one or two instrument at the most because the list is uh, infinite. Um, so all these are the different areas that I would be talking today. So I'll be discussing uh, something about electricity and applications, magnetism and applications, and also astrobiophysics and nanotechnology. And I think you know, if I talk one and a half to two hours of time completely about the subject, I think uh, I don't know how much can be intake. And so I would also like to uh, make it a little interesting and try to provide some other interesting areas so that if you are interested in them, you can definitely uh, choose them as a career option. So as I already told you, I would like to first start the fundamentals of biology, chemistry, and the physics. I think, uh, you know, people, we always think which subject is better or uh, which is the superior subject. But in my opinion, all are same. And even yesterday, you have heard that everything is in interlinked. 
And if you just see a small thing, like, you know, just imagine during the evolution, a man doesn't know all these subjects, right? So he doesn't know physics, he doesn't know chemistry, he doesn't know biology, but yet a, a human himself can survive. But if you understand, if you think a little bit deeper, then you can understand that any living organism is nothing but chemistry. These are nothing but chemical molecules, right? And if you think chemistry is nothing but physics, without any kind of an interaction or the concepts of the physics, there is no possibility for any chemical to exist. So it is like, you know, biology is nothing but physics and chemistry. And then chemistry is the, the physics is a basic of any existence. But what you have to appreciate is that why are we studying anything if there is no human being? Do you think I, I still believe that if there is no human being, the matter still exists, the organ, the biology still exists. But physics, chemistry, mathematics or any areas of uh, studies, what we are doing is just for better living. Uh, one minute. Yeah, it's just for the better living. And uh, as I told you, physics and chemistry do exist even without the human but they are not explored or not admired. And as they say, life goes on even if it is not understood. We only study them for better living. Uh, Ma'am, uh, yeah, okay. And you know, just supporting uh, my view, I think uh, everybody is aware of Stephen Hawking. And he also famously claimed that, you know, while physics and mathematics may tell us how the universe began, they are not of much use in predicting the human behavior because there are far too many equations to solve. You know, it's life itself is a micro universe is what I believe. And trying to understand is so fascinating. And that's the reason it's one of the reasons that I'm in the field of research now. So as I already mentioned, uh, if you take physics, all these are the main important uh, principles like thermodynamics about heat, magnetism, electricity, optics, acoustics, and uh, astrophysics as well. So these are the main branches, I think. Uh, and I will not be discussing so much about uh, electronics. The reason is now in the modern world, even if you have to on any machine, electronics is important. So believing that electronics is an integral part of everything, I'm not discussing so much about electronics in this presentation. So first of all, I think uh, coming into aspects of the physics, OK, I told you a small kind of a story, but do you really think physics is there in life or not? If you say, I think everybody knows that you know human body consists of water, fire, air, space, and uh, these are the basic elements of basic elements present in the life or in the universe. And these are also present in the human beings. For example, you see 83% uh, 83 of the brain consists of, is made of water. A total human body is nothing but water, like, you know, 70% of the land is covered by water. So different parts of the body do have a lot of water content. And the fire, whatever the energy we are taking is nothing but the fire, which is another basic element. And to survive, it is the air which is required. So this is also very important. And the space, for example, the space is nothing but providing you the flexibility of the structures. For example, you have bones and uh, skin, which is like the earth form. And then for these to work properly, properly there is a space which allows you to move properly. So like in the uh, nature, if there is a disturbance in the nature, we are actually already seeing a lot of natural calamities, greenhouse, all these uh, calamities, uh, greenhouse, tsunamis, all these. So there is, if there is a disturbance in these fundamental elements in the body, this causes disease. And the physical elements are the basis of the survival, and they have to be protected. Uh, this is what I think all the advancements is about. And that is a very basic uh, physics in the human body. But if you even more dig deeper, you will understand physics is how uh, integral part physics is in understanding biology. All the basic molecules in uh, biology, such as if you take uh, uh, DNA, if you take RNA, if you take proteins, all these are only uh, existing because of the physical properties. And in addition, we are able to, the scientists in the biology are only able to understand all the, uh, 
properties and then trying to develop drugs only because of uh, knowing a proper physics of them, how they are arranged. For example, structure is a very important component of all the proteins. Only if you know the structure of the proteins, then there is you can know the proper function and you can develop several drugs for them. So, you know, uh, all the physical concepts such as microscopy, NMR, X-ray crystallography, et cetera, and different spectroscopy techniques, all these are only to understand biology better. And only then we are able to understand the biomolecules better and then either change or treat according to the requirement uh, is being done in the modern, even in the modern day. And you know, the new age. So that is a basic, what I told you before, the biomolecules. And if you see in the current generation, the, with the advancements of science, uh, the level of uh, technology has gone to the next level and they're extremely, uh, even far beyond thinking, you know, how uh, physics is being applied. For example, if you assume the neural networks, I think there is a mention uh, about this, even in the yesterday's talks uh, by Dr. Vyas Rao, sir. And you know, consider neural networking or how currently the protein structures are being predicted and molecular dockings, depending upon the structural relations. And even you know, measuring various forms of the electric, magnetic, all these impulses, uh, it's, it's really changing quite fast. And in all this, uh, trust me, physics is such a key component. So having said that, this is like a basic biology. But if you're considering medicine, uh, medical physics is a branch of uh, study, and there are mainly two areas in the field of medical physics. One is called the radiation therapy, and other one is called radiology. So radiation therapy is, again, mainly it is about treatment, you know, uh, like using the radiations. I think everybody is aware of uh, cancer treatments that you are using uh, radiation therapy, right? So all this radiation therapy, how much of the dose has to be given, for example, for a patient, what kind of a dose, and uh, all this comes under radiation therapy. So if you see here, dosimetry is the measurement, calculation, and assessment of ionizing radiation dose uh, for the human therapy, human body. And similarly, brachytherapy is a sealed radiation source that is placed inside or next to the area requiring, requiring the treatment. And these therapies are already being effectively used in uh, several cancers such as cervical, prostate, breast cancer, esophageal, and uh, skin cancer, etc. And now I think most of you are aware of radiology because, uh, which is nothing but uh, medical imaging. Uh, several instruments such as MRI, ultrasound, CT, X-ray are used in a daily uh, treatment uh, regime as well. And there are so many instruments uh, which are currently used for different purposes. So uh, what I do now is this is a basic. And then what I would like to tell is uh, just not telling you that, okay, there is physics and biology and the research. What I would like to do is I would uh, uh, present some interesting physics areas, and I have selected the uh, some uh, uh, areas which are latest research. I think mostly which are like uh, 2019 or 2020 published articles, because for me itself, it was very amazing to see to what extent uh, people are trying to understand the biomolecule uh, biology and also how much physics is present uh, in understanding of biology. So my um, because I think uh, there are biology students as well as the physics students. So that's the reason I try to bring a balance that both of you can at least uh, get some basic concepts about uh, these. So the important point for me is that you understand how much it is implied rather than knowing the complete paper. So I think uh, whoever it is, everybody know that uh, the structure of a cell, right? There are so many organelles, if you consider one small cell, and there are so many organelles, and they perform immense number of uh, functions. And there are billions of proteins in this one particular cell. And it is uh, amazing to see how much study is has gone in understanding a cell, but still uh, it is only a, a small portion what we scientists were able to understand. Uh, so, you know, uh, okay, uh, from 10th class, I think from 8th or something, we study about the cell. But all the faculties, even masters, anybody, you know, what I would like to see is did you uh, try to un understand some basic questions like, you know, how dynamic the cell organelles? Uh, you imagine a cell. Do you people think that the cell is always the same and always the organelles are just stuck something? 
these these are the sign, kind of a questions that if we are able to produce from a very younger age then i think uh, we can truly make great scientists uh, you know all the components of the cell do they just stick or do they are they mobile or uh, is there any kind of uh, designed path that they have to travel in same way or does it depend upon the condition these are some fascinating questions okay uh, i think everybody would know that there is a cytoskeleton of course and all the uh, organelles are attached to that but what about some non organelles such as the nucleolus right do they float or is there uh, and is there anything uh, big, uh, depending upon their movement that they are implicated in the diseases these are some fascinating questions and in order to answer these you know i think uh, last year there was a publication on one of such topic what is called as nucleolar dynamic and i think everybody know a nucleus and uh, a small organelle is called a nucleolus it is not bound to anything it is kind of a very free so it is very important because nucleolus is a center for the cellular protein synthesis because they produce ribosomes ribosomes are the uh, cell organelles which produce proteins and there is this fluid which is surrounding the nucleoli which is a complex etc but just what the scientists have uh, done is um, they try to understand uh, the organal dynamics and in this you know uh, it is completely physics applied uh and these organelle dynamics are uh, hypothesized to play a very important role in disease conditions so what they did was like you know there are so many nuclei in the beginning when the cell is kind of growing as you can see you know there are a lot of nuclei and what happens during the process of the cell development is all these nuclei combine to form one or two big uh, nuclei and in this paper what the scientists have observed is that you know in the normal conditions the shape of the nuclei looks like this but in some kind of the disease conditions which they try to simulate in the lab in in the normal cells uh, they try to deplete the atp which is the energy source i think everybody knows it and if you are depleting atp the shape and the size of the nuclei are decreased and also uh, and also there is the dynamic shape and as well as the movement also reduces so they, what they have observed is that it has a very implication in several diseases such as uh, alzheimers parkinsons etc and they wanted to further understand if this could be to a point which it might be relevant even to the level of diagnostics here you are just seeing the nuclei uh, nucleoli but you know uh, there is a lot of technical uh, difficulty which is involved uh, in order to study to this level as i said i'm not presenting the complete paper or uh, technicalities of the paper the reason is it's a lot of physics and frankly speaking i would need at least 2 to 3 days in order to understand the paper prob uh, properly uh, because all the physical aspects of shape size and viscosity was measured and how these nuclei are combining why they are not moving forward all such things so this is one of the interesting paper what i have found and you can understand it. nucleus itself is very small and some small organelle in the nucleus is what they have studied and similarly you know uh, you i think uh, everybody know uh, soft matter physics but you see a uh, soft matter physics is also applied in biology for example as i already told you there is a cell and in this cell there is always a liquid and liquid phase separation and there is, this generates a lot of condensates as well like you know there are for example if there are so many proteins produced in the cell and there is a lot of thick fluid cytosol and this creates a kind of a condensate this condensate is like a li small liquid areas these could be either proteins peptides rna congregate anything can happen in the cell and typically a eukaryotic cell consists of billions of proteins as i have already mentioned and if you see each condensate is around 1 to 2 micrometer in diameter and they hold around million proteins and these condensates uh, you know they interact with each other they are just uh, not stable uh, not stagnant they just are very dynamic and they just touch and briefly move away leading to this dynamic interaction and um, there are so many biochemical reaction which are also dependent on these dynamic interactions taking place in such condensates uh, for example the best example is chromatin organization or uh, when there is a stress response on the cell these interactions are even more dynamic and one such uh, condensate molecule are called p granules which are nothing but the phase separated liquid droplets 
And you know, these pea granules are very important. Scientists have found that they are really important in the embryonic development in the C. elegans. This is a uh, worm, uh, which is uh, widely studied uh, in biology. And uh, these pea granules um, especially had great implication in the neurodegeneration and in cancers. And if you see, there is uh, this company called the Dewpoint Therapeutics, which is Boston and Dresden in uh, Boston based in US and Dresden based in Germany. Uh, the person Rick Young, he founded this therapeutic uh, company. And I saw that uh, Bayer, which is, you know, one of the biggest companies in the field of medicine, invested over 100 million in the company, uh, which assumes the significance of these pea granules. For example, this is a structure of a pea granule. And these pea granules are very dynamic and they are conducting a lot of research on how these condensates are actually formed and um, how they, they can be used for both diagnosis as well as therapy. So this is a basic uh, interesting areas I thought I would find. And now let's uh, come into the physics, uh, physics principles, for example, uh, electricity. So let's see about the uh, application of uh, electricity in human body and what are the diagnostic values of it so i think everybody know that human body is electric right it is charged and why are you why are we charged because i think there is a necessity that we have to move we have to think and perform so many processes and all these are only because of the electrical stimuli what is being produced in the body constantly and these electrical stimuli are produced by, due to the different electrolytes in the body fluids. You know, important electrolytes include sodium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. And each of these ions are differently distributed and also differently affected in several diseases. And then, you know, if you see the resting potential of different cells and organelles, it is really uh, very different. And I think for those who uh, do, who do not understand resting potential, it is nothing but you know a static elect uh, membrane potential of the cell of a uh, uh, inactive cell. It's some, something like a resting uh, at a resting stage. For example, if you see a neuron, a neuron has a different amount of sodium ions inside and different amounts of sodium uh, in the surrounding environment. So normally a neuron has to be charged and uh, is normally charged and it is in the negative state. This negative state is mainly because of several kinds of amino acids uh, present. As I told you, the composition differs in the cell and depending upon the composition, every uh, cell has a particular amount of uh, ions and thereby it has a different kind of resting potential. For example, inside the neuron, the neuron is, uh, has around minus 70 millivolts of, uh, uh, of resting potential. And because the reason is the ions cannot be just traveling in and out uh, in a free way. The reason is if the electrons can, uh, if the ions can just travel in and out very freely, then I think at one point there will be an equi equilibrium and then there will be a com in a resting state of the cell. And this is not good for the body because we, we have to do some activity. And then, uh, you know, if what happens if the power disturbances in the body? And you, every, I think everybody know that there is this electric shock. What happens when you touch uh, electric wire or uh, such volt, uh, high voltages? But within the body, uh, in the body, if there is even a slight uh, difference in the electric voltage, for example, uh, 0 0.5 to 3 milliampere is just produces the tingling sensations and. Uh, and these different uh, uh, disturbances can cause several conditions like muscle contractions or respiratory, para respiratory paralysis at 30 to 75 milliampere volt directly. And you know, ventricular fibrillation occurs with a high electric charges and the tissues and organs start burning if there is a high amount of uh, electrical uh, disturbance in the body. So, you know, uh, but we cannot tell the, uh, we cannot, we should also remember that this bioelectricity is very essential throughout the life. Just starting from the stage of the birth, for example, if there is no proper electric signals that are being given to the fetus, it leads to several, uh, uh, several uh, abnormalities in the embryonic developmental stage. Birth defects occur and even remodeling is, dist is disturbed. And even the way how the tissues, organs grow and regenerate are also different. I think uh, people, young people should, uh, I think might be knowing that currently there is also a kind of, um, kind of fitness which 
gives you a light amount of the shock in order to build up your muscles. I think they do it for uh, 20 minutes or so, so that you know either if you want to even reduce the weight or increase the weight, this electrical stimulus is being used currently in order to um, increase or decrease weight, as I have mentioned. So electrical stimulation has a great uh, potential in the human life, uh, in the in the human life. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you have to also understand, as I already mentioned, life is nothing but a biochemical enterprise. Even if, even if there has to be a very small movement of a body, it only happens because you know there is a cell and it has different kinds of voltage gated channels, some kind of a channels you can assume. These channels have to be opened or closed. And depending upon that only, there is a transcription of the genes. So the genes are kind of expressed or the genes are kind of silenced. All this silencing happens only when there is a change in the voltage. And only once there is a change in the voltage, the transcription of the genes happen. And this is always a continuous circle, which keeps a body uh, able to perform several functions. So, there, uh, but you, you might think that it is so simple. No, there are so many underlying mechanisms which do take place in such a small time of reaction and uh, making so many things possible. And you know, uh, as I told, another interesting area uh, with regarding to the bioelectricity is like one of the scientists, I think in 2017, they have published a paper. What they have done is the importance of electrical stimuli rather than the brain. You know, even before the, uh, the brain is formed, and even if you remove the brain, even if you remove the if you remove the brain, for example, you know the small electrical stimulus is produced in the body, and these uh, in the absence of the brain, it leads to the deformation of several organs. For example, you see with a proper brain how it is, and without the brain, how the frog is able to grow. The only factor is that the electrical uh, stimuli is different in these. So here, what the what the researchers have performed is they have removed the brain at uh, 25 days of embryos, and then they evaluated uh, how the organ, how the embryo is able to grow. And then you know these embryos, it, it is it is like uh, what they have also found is the theory of electro uh, electric stimulus in development is that. Of course, there are so many neurotransmitters or other signals as they open these uh, voltage gated channels and this affects the cellular behavior. If without the brain, there is no proper signal for these voltage gated channels. So that is the reason there is no proper signal. And then uh, the formation of the uh, central nervous system is greatly affected. But even in the absence of the brain, if a proper voltage is provided, these abnormalities uh, were uh, were seen to be uh, were seen to be reduced, and there is a proper formation of the embryo. Uh, and you know, I think uh, there are so many. Uh, that is the reason there are so many applications about uh, understanding about the bioelectricity and how it can be used both in diagnosis as well as in therapy. And one of the highest used uh, bioelectric, I think you all know, it is in cardiovascular research because cardiovascular research, even till date, it accounts for the highest number of deaths uh, in the world, and it uh, it leads to the great econ uh, economic loss in many of the countries. Uh, I think, you know, heart, it's around like, you know, it beats around 100,000 times a day and uh, it pumps nearly 2,000 gallons of blood per day. And these coronary artery diseases are the leading cause of the deaths. You, uh, imagine that there are around 7 million deaths which are uh, caused due to coronary artery uh, failure. And then the two widely known instruments with regarding to the electricity are and the cardiology and uh, neurology are ECG and EEG. And ECG is electrocardiogram, and you know that electrodes are placed onto the uh, placed on the individual, and then they have they aim to uh, collect the uh, signals of signals from these electrodes and then depending upon these signals a person's heart with ryth heart rhythm can be analyzed and uh, the defects can be recognized similar to the ecg eeg electroencephalogram these have a lot of electrodes placed in the brain and then they are used for the detection of these brain waves 
And depending upon the detection of the brain waves, the signals are amplified and displayed. And this can be used to understand how the brain is actually recall, brain is actually active, and if there are any disease, uh, any disease condition, so that they can be properly treated. And I think uh, uh, having understood the having understood the uh, number of uh, heart diseases, there is a constant research which is going on if there is any possibility uh, in order to prevent this cardiac arrest or uh, improve the heart function. And out of them, a tri is a totally kind of uh, unique research was the, the production of the artificial heart. This is a company which has produced it. It's called Abiocor. Uh, it's an artificial heart, and uh, scientists have previously thought that this could be really a game changer as it can be used for increasing the life expectancy up to one and a half year. And I think um, it was uh, the research was connected on 15 people where they have uh, replaced the heart completely with the abiocor heart and uh, then checked for if it is really efficacy, if, if it shows uh, total efficacy in functioning as a normal heart. But I, I saw that uh, it was not so efficient and the research was abandoned. But I also saw that uh, uh, more than 15 people uh, were, um, were given this abiocor heart and uh, few people were not able to survive longer. So that is a reason 18 months is not so long. Uh, that is a reason it did not gain any further momentum. And you all know that artificial pacemakers uh, are currently being used, which are extremely uh, important uh, important for many uh, for, for many of the heart patients. And then these artificial pacemakers are nothing but the battery operated small electronic devices, which just try to provide some electrical impulse and generate the heart and generate the heartbeat so that you know the patients do have the enough amount of the energy to in order to. Uh, in order to provide a proper amount of the heartbeat. So these are the two main, uh, these are the two uh, research what I found with regarding to improving heart, but there is really a constant need in order to uh, uh, see if there can be a good alternative for these as well. And next, uh, coming to magnetism in the human body. So uh, likewise, how, um, how electricity is present in the human body, magnetism is also a part of a human body. And uh, there is also a concept and an area of science called biomagnetism or biomagnetic biology. Uh, what it is, you all know that you know uh, the magnetic field produced by the living organisms uh, is present, and then they use it for several purposes. For example, different kinds of microorganisms uh, and also some animals use this Earth's magnetic field in order to recognize their way. And many birds, for example, fly thousands and thousands of kilometers only depending upon the magnetic uh, nature of the magnetic nature. And all this study of uh, magnetic biology is only because only because of the ability of the organism to recognize the magnetic fields. And if you see the magnetism in the human body, you see like uh, like human body is an electrical enterprise. Uh, magnetism is also present and you see the different magnetic uh, fields that are present across the body like you know lung particles for skeletal muscles they have different uh, amount of the magnetic uh, power and uh, you see the heart produces electricity and this generates magnetic field around and even compared to the brain, heart is the most powerful generator of the electromagnetic energy in the human body. And it is over 60 times greater than the electrical energy, elect than the uh, energy, uh, electrical activity generated by the brain. And you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to know that one person's heart signal can affect another, people, another person's brain waves and that the heart brain synchronization can occur between two organisms or two people when they interact. With respect to this, there is an interesting research what I have uh, found, which was done, I think, in 2017, 15. So what the scientists have so, uh, have seen and wanted to understand this uh, uh, electric and uh, brain wave of heart and the brain is that they have taken a boy and a dog. They have first normally measured the heart rhythms of, a, of the boy and the dog over here when they are in the separate room. For example, the name of the dog is uh, Mabel and the name of the boy is Josh. So when there are in separate rooms, you see there is a, these are their respective uh, heart rhythms. 
and uh, when the boy entered into the room he loves the dog so much and when both of them enter when they are in a single room you see how synchronous these heart waves are and again when the boy has left the room the you see how uh, unsynchronized these uh, waves are with respect to the dog so what they have what they have seen is that um, you know as as i already said you the heart waves can be captured by the brain and this might lead to a synchronous movement and here you can see you know it's a probably a great affection which reduces the stress of the animal because uh, it is together with the person i think uh, this is something kind of a love between both of them which is uh, making them happy and if you consider magnetism like electricity so i would tell that electric devices so ma uh, so many of the electrical devices used in the diagnosis are the previous generation ones and now many of the devices are using the principle of magnetism uh, you know even for measuring the heartbeat or the brain activity muscular activity neuronal activity so many things and there are so many of the devices which are currently being developed using the principle of um, mag magnetism and uh, in the in in these all diagnostic devices uh, main component being used is a squid which is superconducting quantum interference device uh, i don't know much about it i just read for the for the purpose of the presentation it is a very sensitive magnetometer which are used to measure extremely subtle magnetic field because i think you have seen in my earlier slides that the amount of the uh, magnetic uh, signals in the Teslas are really, really low, which cannot be actually uh, detected with the normal devices. So I think this led to the discovery or invention of these uh, highly sensitive magnetometer called squids. And these are able to measure the electric magnetic fields as low as five auto Teslas. Uh, five auto Teslas is nearly five into 10 to the power of minus 18 Teslas. And uh, some process in animals produce such a small magnetic field between 10 to the power of 9 to 10 to the power of 6 Teslas. So these devices are so sensitive in such a way that even in the deceased condition, if the amount of the magnetic, uh, wave, magnetic field produced is even so small, they are still able to detect them. And I think these um, squids mainly use the uh, principle of Josephine effect, which is a phenomenon of the supercurrent, uh, the current that flows indefinitely long without any voltage applied across a device. And these are called the Josephine junctions. And uh, and these Josephine junctions uh, consist of two or more superconducting device conductors coupled by a weak link. And uh, this Josephine junction effect, I, uh, I saw that they are really currently used in many applications, uh, including in the quantum phenomena. And for this, he has been awarded Nobel Prize in the year 1973. So one of the instruments, uh, what I told I would be discussing about is uh, magnetocardiography. So as I already mentioned, the, the severity of the cardiovascular diseases, which is taking place in the current world. and uh, and so the magnetic, what is the principle is that the cardiac electrical activity produces the voltage. And this produces also the magnetic field. And the magnetic field is recorded and then checked for the disturbances in the cardio in the cardiogram. Uh, this magnet magnetocardiographies are the advanced instruments because uh, unlike the ACGs, they are not affected by the tissues or the body fluids, and thereby they provide even more accurate information. And other advantages of uh, magnetocardiography that they are being used currently, I think, in uh, advanced countries, I don't know if they're used in India as of now, is that there is no radiation and there is no invasiveness or invasiveness, there is no injection or you don't need to hold breaths. And then it, it's really fast. It takes less than 10 minutes and you get good qualitative and quantitative results. And it can be used to test any number of times. And you don't need to even use any kind of electrodes like you use it in the ECG. And this data and the data is really complementary and it, uh, to the data of CT, MRI, ECHO, PEC, etc. And uh, many diseases which are unable to be detected by uh, ECG were able to be detected by magnetocardiography, such as arrhythmia, uh, and even 
it can be used to diagnose the fetal cardiac disorders and then screening of the patients for ischemic heart disease. And uh, due to such uh, uh, several of such applications, magnetocardiography is widely being used as an alternative compared to that of the ECG. So here you see, without any kind of touching of electrodes or anything, there is the magnetocardiogram, which is uh, which measures uh, all these. Um, all these signals of magnetic signals. So this co this coil or the squid cans is uh, placed uh, above the heart of the patient, and then uh, you know uh, it operates. The uh, the sensitive magnetic fields are being able to detect, and then all these points, for example, are you know collected. The information is collected from thirty six different points of the cardiogram, and then they are all clubbed together, and uh, they come into conclusion depending upon different color patterns what are given. And I think there are some controls uh, which are used for this purpose so that they know what is a normal uh, rhythm, and uh, thereby they give you the results. And other important uh, application as of uh, currently modern world, which we are using is magnetomyograph. It is nothing but the usage of the magnetic uh, devices for, for uh, uh, knowing the muscul muscular activity. They are used to record, especially this is used in the sports field and also for the people who are su uh, suffering from different uh, different conditions such as epilepsy or the spinal cord lesions or traumatic nerve injury, all this. So these also use the same squids and uh, they also can be uh, used for detecting very slow currents uh, which are used to measure, you see, uh, 10 to the power of minus 12 in the picos or the femtoteslas of the magnetic field. And there are many devices which are being developed in order to produce certain amount of the electrical activity so that normal movements, uh, movements can be restored. And then uh, similar to the ECG, there is also magnetoencephalography. So, uh, magnetic encephalography is for neuroimaging technique and to record the brain activity. And this also uses the squids. And uh, this is even more advanced than the ECG because it can be used for locating several abnormalities as well as in the experimental setup with just uh, recording brain activity also. And this is so precise that it can be used to resolve even which are even precise than 10 milliseconds or even faster for which I think uh, the traditional techniques such as FMR, fMRI, all these cannot uh, detect. And uh, the magnetoencephalogram is also used to measure the changes in the blood flow. And uh, and it can be used, uh, this blood flow changes at such at several hundreds of the milliseconds. So the readings of these magnetoencephalograms were reported to be extremely accurate and um, different areas, such as uh, auditory, somatosensory, and the motor areas functions can be accurately detected using this magnetoencephalogram. And these are also used to detect the cognitive processes and uh, even used at the time of in, for the fetuses uh, and the newborn uh, readings, how the working of the brain uh, is uh, present in these fetuses. And of course, they are widely used for uh, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, tumor, as well as Alzheimer's patients to detect the changes in the activity of the brain. And now I would uh, like to uh, focus more. Uh, I would like to focus on astrobiophysics. I think you all might be uh, might have heard about these unique uh, experiments or uh, research which is taking place with respect to uh, astrobiophysics. One is NVHub research. Uh, you know, NASA. I think last year or before last year, they have uh, made an advertisement that they would be paying around nineteen thousand dollars for the people who are ready to just stay in bed. But it is a, not a normal bed, but it has to be a, it is a bed uh, which is like a centrifuge and it would be continuously rotating. And, and these experiments were done by NASA in association with uh, German uh, space science uh, research, which, uh, German space science research. And just to add more about it, you know. So what happens is, you know, uh, the scientists want to study what is the uh, what is the influence of the gravity, and uh, is it really possible for the life to uh, exist in different planets or on the moon or in the outer space? Because you know there is a lot of uh, space competition going on, and then they want to uh, study if how long the humans can also stay in the outer space. If it is a reality that one day there will be a journey to the moon or to the Mars uh, and you can stay there for some days. And so, you know, 
so it is very important that uh, before all such possibilities come into reality, there has to be a proper investigation uh, in the re in with respect to the astronaut health and their performance in the in the space. So that is reason uh, all these research are being conducted on uh, how the gravity affects and also what are the measures that have to be taken if there are any ne negative effects of uh, microgravity. <laughs> And uh, especially, as I already mentioned, even there are now uh, uh, space missions to Mars, Venus, all the planets. And uh, it is very important to know how these uh, principles affect the life of a human body in the space. And this was a study about for it's called the Egbresa study. And uh, this is this was a 60 day study. And this came to end, of course, in December 19. I think uh, the results are available as well. Or I think still they are analyzing a lot of uh, a lot of data with respect to that. And apart from this, um, this NV, NV, NV rehab, in, uh, NV have research uh, from NASA is also focused on several other parameters such as vision impairment and also intracranial pressure because many of the astronauts do have uh, the effects of the pressure in their brain, which is quite risky. And uh, there is a lot of risk in the visual impairment and uh, hypertension occurs after the space flight. And also, uh, because of these gravity effects, there is a shift in the fluidics uh, before and after the journeys and then uh, other um, other parameters such as how the proteins are changed in within the, how how your body totally changes you know this would be best describe that and all these are highly active in areas i think the uh, the thing is that maybe we are we will not be able to know this properly and unless and until we really go into the space research centers and see them so these are actually great opportunities if people are interested in such space research and in order to uh, understand these, you know, so instead of uh, the 60 individuals which were taken for the NV rehab, there are some scientists who have also uh, taken it to the other level. Like first, we wanted to try to understand in the mice if if we can, if we are able to understand in the mice, then I think you know uh, at least basic views can be then can, uh, used upon the human beings. So what they have done is these mice are called mighty mice, and what they have done is. Uh, they have sent some mice, uh, around 40 mice were launched in the SpaceX machine, uh, I think in last year, yeah, in last year. And then they came back, of course, uh, this year, and then they have studied these mice. So before sending these mice, sci scientists already have some candidates, which they think might be very beneficial in preventing the bone loss. As I told, out of several effects, uh, mass muscle mass loss and the loss of the bone mass has been a great problem for the astronauts. And in order to prevent this, they had some candidates which are myostatin and active in A signaling. But actually, compound name is called, this is the name of the compound, ACVR2B. We don't know what this compound is because it's a secret uh, at this point of time. So this acts on uh, myostatin and active in A signaling in the bones, and this prevents the bone loss. Just for an example, you see, uh, this is these are the mice which were not given the injection of uh, this particular drug and you see the size the size is very small and these are the mice which have received the injection and the size of these mice are big and that's the reason they were called the mighty mice and here if you see the bone for example in the untreated uh, the femur bones of these mice uh, is very distorted and the fibers are also very thin kind of, whereas when the drug is given to the mice, the structure is preserved and there is a very less uh, damage to the bones. And these are the another vertebra of the same. Like, you know, without this, you see a lot of gaps, which implies that there is a degeneration of the bone mass uh, of the astronauts without the drug, whereas uh, the bones, uh, the bone mass is preserved and it's also better in the mice which have been treated with the drug. So this is another, this is a kind of achievement. And probably I think uh, after several other studies and analysis, I think probably this uh, signaling mechanism could be targeted in order to prevent the bone loss for the astronauts. And if you just think the question, why all this research? You know, uh, billions and billions of dollars is being spent on different kinds of these researches. And this is not just for astronomers, astronomers, as I already mentioned, because in the coming years, space travel will be a reality. 
And uh, if you ask for the statistics, as of August 2019, there has been 218 spacewalks which have been carried out from the uh, space station and space station which orbits the Earth 16 times. And the cost of this is over $150 billion. And recently, NASA has even been trying to defray this one, offering the visit for the space station. I think the cost which was mentioned in the website is around $35,000 a night, which is nearly 25 lakh rupee INR. So if people are interested, they can go to the moon for a day, they can go to the space for a day. And I think if the drugs are also developed, they can be safely uh, taken to the space and then safely brought. So that is a reason uh, there is a lot of research which is taking place. And I think uh, you can also you are also aware of this studying that there is a lot of exobiology research. And what is exobiology? It's nothing but exo is outside uh, of the universe. Uh, is outside right so it is like what is the origin what is the evolution what is the distribution are there any living creatures in anywhere uh, of the universe people are really trying to study all these and then how can we adapt if there is a future uh, a future chance of going into such planets where there is a feasible environment to lie to live so there are so many aspects which are being done. And for this purpose, there are so many instrument developmental programs which are being performed. For example, you would have seen uh, the centrifuge, uh, what I have shown before. And uh, all these devices are being also produced. And there are so many opportunities if you can try to check what are the areas. And then depending upon this, if you can try to uh, suggest a plan or hypothesize a plan about it. And then also, how the planets can be protected by external threats is also a plan, even though you don't believe it, like you see in the movies, if there are some other uh, uh, aliens from others attacking, how can we protect the Earth? This is also an active research, although you don't hear it uh, very often. And also, you know, uh, protecting the solar system bodies from the contamination by the Earth. I think uh, even the space is getting a lot contaminated with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of space debris is what they call. And how to even prevent the accidents from these and protecting the Earth from other forms and or from our own uh, um, own devices in the space is also a very active uh, research area. And uh, okay, so you can uh, just visit the NASA Astrobiology Institute for all such interesting research and uh, try to accordingly uh, develop your ideas or then uh, in your careers. And I think uh, this is the latest news, what everybody would have known in the newspapers that there is also possibility of uh, life in Venus, uh, which is a new destination now. I think uh, Mars is being already studied so much and so now it is Venus. And scientists have discovered phosphine gas on Venus. So why there is a, so much of talk like phosphine, phosphine? What is phosphine gas is normally it is produced by the living organisms on Earth. And it is a toxic gas and uh, it cannot be produced in the normal, uh, in the in the un, in the unnatural ways because non biological sources cannot even make one tenth of the amount of the phosphine. Uh, it has to be either industrially produced uh, or else it has to be produced by life forms, and that is the reason scientists have just found two. I think they found around the sig uh, signature of twenty uh, phosphine molecules in every billion molecule billion particles that they have tested on the Mars, and they could detect this itself is so much of higher amount uh, and that is the reason uh, this phosphine uh, uh, indicates that there could be a possibility of uh, life on venus uh, just to uh, to uh, to let you know that the day, day temperatures are greater than 460 degrees celsius and there are sulfuric acid clouds and very inhospitable environment for the human survival on venus but how did this living form came, whether they are microorganisms or any other life forms is under research. And now definitely there will be so many space missions which countries will be aiming in Venus uh, to understand uh, life on Venus and the possibility. And I think uh, even India is planning uh, a space mission to Venus, which is called Shukrayan. And uh, I don't know if you are aware or not, Sh uh, um, Shukrayan 1, with respect to this, ISRO have uh, offered many of the Indian universities 
if they are interested to produce any uh, generate some kind of a machines like satellites or any devices which they wanted to send it to the space along with the Sukrayan mission so that the science payload can be sent and then um, they can study so it is like uh, you know ISRO and student cooperation and you might all be aware that recently to the even to the mission to the moon and other space missions ISRO is sending several satellites from the students of the universities um, and then uh, this announcement of opportunity has already been notified in 2017 and as of December 2019 16 Indian and seven international payloads have been shortlisted and in future missions there are several possibilities from ISRO and several space agencies if you are able to produce particular instrument they are really ready to send and ISRO is offering so many training programs as well and if you have an idea of one particular kind of a satellite that you wanted to study they are even providing you the guidance and so these uh, images I wanted to show is like, you know, people think that these are the kind of uh, homes that homes or what you call uh, ISS, which would be taking place in the Venus in the future. These are called the Havocs, which are high altitude Venus operational concept, uh, the Venus floating cities, which NASA plans. <laughs> And uh, now I would like to uh, mention or discuss about nanotechnology. I think uh, this is a future of uh, medicine and also every field, literally speaking. Why nanotechnology? Why nanotechnology? Because nano, nano as all of you might know, this is like uh, 10 to the power of minus nine size. And Already, it is a multi-billion dollar by this point of time. And uh, by 2024, the nanotechnology is expected to exceed over $125 billion market. Uh, the reason for this is nanotechnology, the size is extremely small. And then versatility of the applications. Literally, you can produce anything in nano. And technology is fast developing towards such a direction that uh, small and effective uh, is what the say is and the mode of delivery because it is extremely small you can deliver even to the smallest of areas especially in the human body even if you have to cross the cells or the membranes this can be possible and the cost depending on because you don't need to produce a high amount maybe the initial technology might be expensive but with the competition i think the cost of the nanotechnology devices deliveries or drug or uh, drugs everything should be coming down as we use the normal uh, normal uh, equipment at this point of time and also because the size is more so small the precision as well as the invasion, especially in case of the surgeries or the drug deliveries is extremely specific. And this is one of the, uh, these are a uh, few qualities which is making nanotechnology to rule the world in the next generation. I think a few examples of how much nanotechnology has been developed in the field of the medicine are, for example, there is a, well, I think one of the first devices is called the PillCam, which in 2001 uh, was approved by the FDA. This is nothing but a small camera, nano camera, uh, which can be just swallowed. And then this can be used for the uh, clinical procedures. And later it came another pill called the smart pill. And this smart, uh, this smart pill, like the uh, pill cam, is used in so many uh, surgeries. And just see that the pill cam has already been used in more than 2 million uh, surgical procedures. And this smart pill, uh, is used to record the internal images, especially uh, these are currently used for gastrointestinal tract uh, of the medical diagnosis. Because uh, in, in small areas such as small intestine, you cannot, uh, you cannot really uh, see what are the faults or you cannot in, in, introduce a device because it is very complicated. Even to such a complicated uh, sites, these smart pills can take the pictures and record the video also if possible. Uh, so that is the reason these smart pills have been um, uh, taking center stage at the research, especially with respect to the gastrointestinal tract. And the primary use, as I told you, is a small intestine and uh, uh, which endoscopy such as colonoscopy cannot be used. And apart from uh, surgical procedures, uh, smart pills are also used in order to detect unexplained bleeding and also abdominal pains, what is responsible uh, of uh, responsible for abdominal pain if there are any uh, uh, if there are any uh, callings or uh, if there are any polyps which are undetectable by the traditional colonoscopy and such as uh, 
traditional colonoscopy, even like ulcers, tumors, all these are can be detected using this uh, smart pill technology. And uh, another device, a nano device, uh, is called the Vibrant Capsule. And this is also like a small uh, capsule, uh, which is uh, actually, this is currently under patent, uh, currently under clinical trials. Uh, it has finished the phase two clinical trials. And the purpose of this is mechanically induce the peristaltic movement, the bowel movement in the gastrointestinal tract, so that it can help in treating the constipated patients without any side effects. And also this is used to uh, stimulate the intestinal walls and induce the natural peristaltic activity. Uh, this is chemical free and uh, it can be easily washed out of the body with the normal bowel movement. So it is very safe to use and this is very small. So, um, so that is the reason it is expected to finish the clinical trial three also soon. And with regarding to the uh, uh, nanobots, so nanobots are also small nano robots is what you can uh, uh, imagine. So these na small nanobots are used uh, in the eye surgeries. So what they do is small size helical robots. These are the small uh, nanobots. These small helical robots are introduced into the vitreous of the vitreous of the eye using a needle, as you see here. And these are um, um, these are magnetic kind of particles, and uh, using the magnetic field or na or nano propellers, they swim to the site. They are uh, of course directed by the doctors. They swim to the uh, site of the retina, where they can be used to clear some clots, clear some clots in the eye, or some plaques, or some kind of uh, some kind of tish uh, tissue overgrowth, all such things. So these are expected to be uh, site. These are expected to reach the site of interest and also at the point of uh, desired point they can release either uh, uh, drugs sometimes or even they can clear the tissue and uh, this could be used in the future these are also kind of uh, devices which are which will be used in future so often and then especially uh, the first um, research area where nanotechnology has been greatly uh, looked after is for the drug delivery so in case of the drug delivery, because of its size, uh, you people, uh, scientists aim to uh, use exactly what is the amount of the uh, concentration required for that particular uh, site. Because now you, th you know, you use uh, at least a little bit higher doses because it has to be uh, taken up by the body, it has to be spread. And in order to prevent any, the, any loss of activity of the drug, generally the dosage might be a little higher. But if you see with the nanos, what you can do is nanoparticles can be used to control the delivery as well as to release exactly at the site where it has to reach so that the active ingredients can be minimum, minimally used. And nanoparticles are also kind of, you know, they're also kind of charged particles and they can also be decreated by the body or rejected by the body. So the, impo the main targets are how to protect these nanoparticles and these nanoparticles should be reaching that particular side and should deliver the drug according uh, at where it is necessary. So scientists have developed such a kind of micelles where small capsules surrounding these uh, nanoparticles are produced and this, uh, the active ingredient is produced into the nanoparticle and then they are delivered to the site of spe specific site and they are also controlled in such a way that they release the drug only at that site and also at the time uh, when it is required. So this is a very active research area and there are a lot of breakthroughs which are currently happening in, uh, with regarding to this field. And nanotechnology is not just uh, in the health, as I already told you, uh, nanophysics, you can tell. Uh, this is also mainly used in uh, agriculture as well. For example, you see the application of nanotechnology in agriculture, you know, uh, because of all the qualities like precise and then size, they are used in various ways. For example, in the precise farming, where exactly nanonutrients can be used. And also scientists want to record how the nutrients are being used, whether it is, is it a proper site and uh, even in case of the crop protection uh, to produce the nano pesticides because they can be uh, uh, they need not be used in very high quantities and and they can be targeted uh, precisely on the uh, on particular type of uh, on particular type of insects or pests 
and also i think you know nano uh, i think you know the transgenic uh, transgenic crops what are uh, produced already uh, gm crops you say and uh, i think in the future they wanted to even more precisely they wanted to uh, develop such such crops so that uh, so that food production can be enhanced with all these uh, nanonutrients. But I am a strong supporter, a supporter of the natural kind of the vegetation and nanobiotechnology can be used even to deliver uh, natural ingredients, what you call biofertilizers also to these crops so that they are even more safer and uh, they can be used effectively for uh, good crop production, also protecting the crops against uh, many conditions. And uh, and also other one, uh, it's also other area of uh, nanobiotechnology, nanotechnology, which has uh, been widely studied. It's called agrivoltaics. Agrivoltaics is nothing but agriculture and voltaics, nothing but the solar panels. So people are trying to combine uh, combine agriculture uh, with with nano with the solar energy. So they want to produce effective uh, nano related agrivoltaics so that they are they can be used for sharing of solar energy by both solar panels as well as the crops. Uh, because once there is a saturation, uh, the plants do not perform the photosynthesis. So what they do is in order to prevent all the rest of the energy uh, from the plants, they because only during the photosynthesis plants plants take up the carbon dioxide, right? And uh, during the other fields, there is a lot of evaporation of the water from the plants and uh, also the energy from the fields. So that is the reason they want to use this agrivoltaics so that uh, the energy can be managed effectively. And a lot of countries, including India, are using uh, agrivoltaics. And there are also other uh, sub area called dynamic agrivoltaics, which also uses a tracking system of how much amount of the light uh, that the plant have used or how much amount it is required for the plant. And then accordingly open or close these nano uh, these solar panels on the top uh, so that solar panels can be effectively used to control and also uh, produce the agriculture. And what I have read is by using such uh, agrivoltaics, there is a huge improvement in the crop production and also the plant performance. At least I think there was around 30 to 40 percent increase of the crop production just by change in the alignment of the solar panels. And you know, depending upon the season, for example, in the winter seasons in the Europe, there has to be huge amount of uh, uh, sunlight that is required for the plants because normally you don't see a lot of sun during the winters. And do all these factors together, uh, agrivoltaics is a coming up field, and they can be very effective in tackling the uh, food production issues in the world. And as I already mentioned, you know, uh, the advantages of these agrivoltaics, the grape farmers were able to profit 15 times higher than reported. And the cucumber and lettuce were able to save around 29% because of this evaporation uh, of the fruit or even uh, the plant performance also. And 30% increase in economic value for the farmers have been obtained using this agrivoltaic system. And one of the papers what I have uh, read about this one was published by MIT University Lucknow. Uh, in 2007 where they have done some studies on the vineyards in India uh, by using this photovoltaics. And another uh, uh, other interesting uh, research, and this would be the future uh, also, is like uh, now nanoscience is also uh, gone to next level to produce another area where you also study sub nanoparticles, which are called SNCs, sub nanoparticles. And these sub nanoparticles are studied using the molecules called dendrimer, molecule, dendrimer molecules. And these dendrimer molecules are less than the size of the nanometer, like very small nanoparticles, such as 0 0.5 nanometers to 2 nanometers. And these dendrimers are highly uh, thought, highly selected because they have very distinct properties and they are expected to be as excellent catalyzers in electrochemical reactions and also during the quantum phenomena. And they can be used in several future applications, even including the quantum, uh, quantum devices. And uh, all this research was possible using surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy uh, uh, to study these uh, to study these sub nanoparticles.
And as I just want to mention about dendrimers because I found this is very interesting and uh, this could be a technology what you can sort of. Uh, so these dendrimers are, you know, structurally perfect molecules. Dendrimers is nothing but dendron, which is like a tree like, you know, tree like component, as you can see over here. And these are structurally perfect, which is normally difficult with many of the molecules. Structurally different, uh, structurally perfect molecules are highly symmetrical and also spherical compounds. It has a core. It has an inner shell and it has an outer shell. And then uh, these dendrimers are used in order to conjugate with other chemical species. For example, as I already told you, even if it is a nanoparticle or a nanodrug, these are normally rejected by the body. So it has to be properly packed so that uh, you give a natural kind of uh, natural kind of touch to the nanoparticles or the dendrimer molecules so that they are not rejected by the body. Thereby, then you can uh, do whatever you want with regarding to the nanoparticles. And this is not simple. This is very challenging. So these dendrimer molecules are found to be one of such molecules which can be very stable and they can be conjugated with different chemical species and they can be used as uh, detecting agents as well. And they are used uh, as of now, they are used as affinity ligands and targeting compounds and also the radial ligands. And uh, they, can, they are also being used for imaging reagents and also in pharmaceutically active compound. So they are used in drug delivery, sensor technology as well, and else and also for producing nanoparticles. And these dendrimers are ex 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 uh, especially favorable in the drug delivery because one of the highly sought out uh, research area is uh, uh, drugs crossing the blood brain barrier. Uh, normally the drugs don't reach the brain because brain is very, very tightly packed and they don't allow the entry of the substances into the brain. Uh, many 98% uh, of the small molecule drugs which are presently there do not cross the blood brain barrier and 100% of the large molecule drugs do not cross the BBB. And it is a, such a challenging field in order to allow temporary opening so that the drug enters and then close. Because if you are not closing the brain uh, barrier properly, then many of the immune related stuff goes on and it is not at all good for the brain. So these dendrimal molecules are shown to cross the blood brain barrier. And then it, they are uh, they normally need uh, just thousand fold lower dose than the normal drugs what we are currently used. So these are the two qualities which they think they have a huge potential to deliver drugs even for the case of other disease also. And I saw that there is a company in Australia. I also visited the website. It's called the Star Pharma, and they are completely uh, dendrimer based uh, company. Uh, they have so many products uh, with regarding to these and they, uh, with regarding to the dendrimers either in the stage of uh, clinical trials are already approved. And they have this uh, dendrimer molecules called SPL7013, which is a uh, astrodrimer sodium. And uh, this is actually already approved to treat the bacterial vaginosis um, and also spread many other diseases in many other countries. And currently, uh, they are also uh, developed some product in order to uh, test COVID-19 as an antiviral nasal spray also against uh, COVID-19. They already tested, and I think, uh, I don't know the results as of now. And this company has been awarded the grant of $1 million uh, for this development of uh, COVID-19 nasal spray development. I think it's currently in the clinical trial, if, if I'm not wrong. So apart from that, I think uh, there are so many advantages with the nanotechnology, right? And people who think that it is completely advantage are completely wrong. The reason is as the technology develops, there are both pros and cons. We have seen several advantages of nanotechnology, but there can be careers where you can focus on uh, on um, uh, treating the disadvantages as well. For example, there might be a huge amount of the nano waste which might be generated, and this has to be addressed. And uh, how you have to threaten because. Uh, the nanoparticles are so small. If you if if they enter into the human body, the unwanted nanoparticles, how can they treat they be treated? And also, if the nanotechnology is developed, probably there will be a huge impact on the job market uh, because all these devices can replace many macro devices itself. So you have to be extremely uh, either knowledgeable in this field as well, or else you know you maybe uh, you will lose lose your job. Come kind of. 
and definitely one highly area where people have to work on is it compromises the safety i think tomorrow i will be presenting you some interesting uh, nanotechnology uh, related uh, research in regarding to the neuroscience and uh, how people are now even thinking to capture your memories and then uh, function brain function can be controlled kind of uh, so all this would be the next issues and this could be the interesting area how you can um, prevent these and then uh, i think with these are the most areas what i have talked about i think i did not bore you so much with regarding to uh, all the instrumentation but now uh, i also would like to now mention some more some more interesting areas what are happening across the world so uh, you know international fusion experiments uh, i don't know if you all know it if you all know i'm the ignorant person about this so it's called the iter which is the called the way in latin okay this is one of the most ambitious and one of the most expensive projects across the world uh, which is which is currently going across the world uh, this is present in the us and this is a project which is collaboration of 35 countries and what they did was they wanted to build the world's largest tokamak this tokamak is nothing but a magnetic fusion device that uh, produces uh, carbon free source of energy uh, the same principle using what happens in the sun okay and uh, this is the largest magnetic confinement plasma physics experiment which is in use you see this is a tokamak which is placed in this and the, the aim of this project is to produce 500 megawatts of output for 50 megawatts of input of energy and if you imagine the cost of this project is over 12 billion dollars and which is equal to almost 1 lakh crores uh, this is considered to be one of the most expensive experiments in the world and if you are interested uh, you can go through this uh, experiment the reason why i am presenting these interesting research are uh, you know if you are good at physics or if you have big dreams these are the areas where you can really target you go through these websites you read about this and if you have ideas or if you have expertise on such particular field do not hesitate to contact them and i think uh, if you're worth you would be in such places and the other one i think everybody knows about this the quantum computer but i don't know if you are really aware of what a quantum computer is and uh, but trust me this is going to be the future uh, within the next 50 years probably but i think the technology has already started and the two companies which are in the race to develop the best of these are ibm and uh, google and nasa together uh, this system what i have showed here is a ibm q system 1 so this is a computer what you do the calculation with the quantum applying the quantum uh, physics in place and for the biology students probably uh, what is a quantum physics or what is com quantum computation so quantum is a minimum amount of any physical thing needed to interact with something else usually referring to the smallest units of energy or matter uh, i don't want to talk so much of uh, so much about this because i am not right person to do this but what i want to, uh, you people to do is uh, there is an excellent video which is present in the ibm website about this uh, even a kids can understand that so i want you to go through that website if you are interested but i want what i wanted to tell you is that uh, the quantum supremacy is uh, is uh, currently being worked out by all these companies, whoever wants to uh, achieve the high supremacy. And it is like, you know, the quantum computers can make your processors, it's like 3,600 times more than this faster com compared to the current day computers. But of course, because it's in the very basic uh, stage, the, es the uh, estimated cost of the first quantum quant computer is around $15 million. In some reports, I have even seen that it is going to be 1 billion, but uh, I want it to be in a little lesser side. So I saw it's around $15 million. And they assume that um, it is most beneficial in drug discovery, cybersecurity, finance, or investment, healthcare. But I, as I told you, you know, uh, sometimes if it is used in drug discovery and if it is used in the um, in the neurological research, then I think they will even uh, capture your memories. So I think, uh, of course, a lot of ethical guidelines will be there. But I think uh, I'm compl I would be against of uh, using the qu quantum for uh, any kind of neuroscience related uh, equipment or device. And also, uh, what they think is the quantum computers, you know, even the uh, normal, the first stage quantum computers using these, you can measure, uh, you can calculate the integers or factors which cannot be even dreamt of calculating with the modern computers. It would take billions of years for the normal computers to calculate uh, the uh, calculate what quantum computer can do with regarding to the present generation. 
and then as i told you uh, the basics i think uh, Uh, normally, uh, you know, the computers, they just store and change the information. And the current computers use the bit system, zero and one binary systems, right? But the quantum computers using uses the quantum uh, mechanical properties to manipulate the information. And the information what is used in the quantum computer is called the qubits. I think currently uh, there is five qubits or fifth 10 qubits of uh, uh, quantum bits which they are able to do and uh, the problem is in order to uh, in order to maintain these qubits there has to be extremely cold com cold uh, condition which i would uh, discuss in the next slide and that is the reason you see a huge machine because all this quantum uh, quantum properties in order to st be stable they have to be maintained in the cold uh, in the cold yeah and the main mechanical properties of the uh, quantum properties which are uh, which uh, which exist are the superimposition entanglement and interference as i told you it i would really advise you if you're interested into this it's an amazing field uh, <clears throat> if you want to know more about it just visit the ibm official website what i have given here so that uh, you will be uh, knowing more better so you see this is a complete quantum computer what i have shown you before there are so many parts all these parts are mainly in order to cool down the chip uh, the uh, uh, chip which is uh, for processing and um, you know for example i don't know if it is very clear or not so for example this is a part one which is called the qubit signal amplifier and uh, this is uh, the amplifier which is cooled down to around minus 269 degrees celsius which is nearly around 4 kelvin and then this is called the input uh, microwave lines and then this is called the superconducting coils and then these are the cryogenic insulators and um, and number 5 yeah and this one is a quantum amplifiers cryopump shield and finally the mixing chamber all these i think here you would be having a chip kind of over here or here and all these see that the temperature is so low uh, in this mixing chamber if you see the temperature is around minus 271 degree centigrade which means the uh, the cold is even more colder than the outer space all this uh, pr uh, protect the signal and these are used to read and making the computation so uh, there are so many opportunities in this field because uh, if you know the coding and if you're interested in coding even ibm offers a con quantum circuit using the python and this is avail this information is also available in the website and if you know python you can also do some coding this is a free source available and you can uh, be directly connected to the ibm server and see what is the coding and what is um, what can be done and if you are able to really uh, improve some things i'm definitely sure it's a great opportunities uh, to work at and um, yes and also uh, if you are faculty people and if you are aiming for the higher careers what i have seen is ibm quantum research program is designed to help the members of the quantum science community and uh, you know with access to more systems and they are providing you all this uh, to be accessed that but the requirement is that at least you should be able to publish one paper in the field of quantum information uh, and I think you can aim for this also if you are very good at physics and then there in the normal college, but you have aspiring high. And there is a video. And as I already told you, Google and NASA are working together. And I think IBM is far superior at this point of time than Google and NASA. I'm not sure about it. Please check. But uh, these three are highly working on it. And I think finally, this is a final research area, what I would be talking about. We have seen about quantum computing, right? This is about using quantum mechanics and producing a huge machine. But at the other end, there is also DNA, which is considered to be the future of the information storage. Because you see a big quantum computer. On the other side, you see DNA. DNA is very, very dense and very, very small. And it is one million times it is like one million times denser than any of the magnetic or other materials which are currently used. And this is so easy to replicate. And DNA is extremely stable. I think many of the biology people know it, the how stable DNA is. And it takes very less time, maybe one hour or one and a half hour to replicate a DNA into several millions of copies. And it can be very stable. I think, you know, even now you see some paleontology research where scientists are able to study the fossils. And this is a kind of uh, amber where uh, during the uh, during the course of the evolution, some uh, uh, some creatures are just stuck to the amber and they are still preserved as well as studied. And scientists can take this fossil and then uh, check about the DNA and see to which species it is belong, etc. And the information can be easily stored. Uh, and you imagine the space. 
it is so cost effective that um, cost effective that the storage device if at all is successful it has you know like uh, it one gram of uh, one gram of dna can be used to store around 215 petabytes 250 petabytes for your easy understanding is equal to 215 million gigabytes of data just one gram of dna so this is a technology which i think uh, will have a great future and uh, i microsoft is i think the leader of uh, this technology i think in the 2018 there was a paper with regarding to this that scientists were able to also perform the computing using the using the dna so this is the first fully automated system to store as well as to retrieve the information i think you all people know that currently in the computers you use zero and one as a binary system but in case of the dna dna is is made up of atgc like four chemical compounds and these are used for the coding now and different permutations and combinations are one which are used to code different and this team of um, uh, uh, louis says and karen were successfully able to encode the word hello in the snippets of the fabricated dna and then they were able to convert it back to the signal to digital using a fully automated end to end system so scientists aim at producing these synthetic dna molecules and then they were able to also successfully store over 1 gigabyte of the readable information in various forms of media audio video etc and this was published in nature biotechnology 2018 as i mentioned the the quantum computer and the dna technology is uh, still a long way to go but this will be the future uh, future of the technology and i think it would be great to to be part of this and i think in conclusions i try to explain you as many as uh, fascinating areas of science which are extremely good for your careers as well as money and um, this and i think you will be working on your passions having seen all these great areas and how much physics is implied in biotechnology in uh, in biotechnology or biology and in my point of view as uh, uh, of of course tomorrow i'll be telling more about the careers but i think uh, astrophysics quantum computings or also memory devices of dna all this has a great future and and trust me to all the students and even the faculties who are aiming high there are unlimited opportunities and it is your you have to start doing some kind of a research uh, um, in in your labs and you will have a great future for sure we are not getting opportunities only because we are not searching properly and if you want to earn high as uh, dr abdul kalam said and it's a great quotation to start the seminar with you you should not uh, dream big you also should act accordingly and with this uh, i would like to conclude and then what uh, my tomorrow tales would be like today we have seen different areas of physics uh, like similarly we will tomorrow i will um, uh, present some applications of uh, physics such as uh, sound uh, by uh, sound in medicine and what are its applications biophysics and neuroscience optics and my optics especially microscopy and covid innovations social preneurs higher education in germany fellowships and scholarships and key to career with this i would like to uh, conclude my talk and i would like to sincerely thank uh, the principal ma'am just the quadrus for accepting uh, me to be a speaker and also dr little flower ma'am who have invited me and i would also like to uh, thank uh, lasina ma'am who has given me the first opportunity last time to talk about covid and i think uh, this is the second opportunity uh, because of her and i also wanted to like to thank all my chaperon team members uh my teachers friends and family for the support and even the members of my pharma center in frankfurt because uh, i have not gone to the lab and then staying here to give my present and uh, they are very flexible about it so thanks a lot i hope i did not crush your brains um and what i would like to ask is please try to provide your genuine feedback uh, so that it can help me to improve in my future presentations uh, you can really share it uh, very truly and uh, because i try to uh, i want to always improve so with this i would like to thank and i would be very happy to take any questions with regarding to these aspects and thank you thanks a lot dr rajkumar uh, just we will give two minutes time if they have any doubts or any questions uh, just we will meet whether they could ask yes sir yes sir yeah. so some questions are they uh, let me read out to the part he has asked mm -hmm. are magnetic and electric field produced by various organs like heart etc or perpendicular mm -hmm. to each other perpendicular to each other uh, ma'am I, i think i will not be the expert to answer that if their level of per perpendicularity ma'am sorry <laughs> because in communications we say electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other he he was a bit curious to know about uh, in uh, biology i don't know they... no okay. i don't no. know about it yeah, yeah, yeah. 
another question one person yeah. has asked from grassroots director of photography if, okay. if it's that fast why don't we use a type of shade core and give access to high speed database i think it is with regarding to the quantum computers uh, so yes it is it is uh, high speed and if you want to know more information please try to visit the ibm website as i told you it is very complicated uh, for me to can get the complete picture of uh, quantum computing i know the basic but uh, if you want to have the complete uh, description i think uh, please visit the ibm website for it or i can send you some papers if you want about it many have asked for the recording of your talk and yesterday's talk to be shared with them definitely we mm -hmm. will share sir yeah i think you would permit us to share your ppt also with them uh, we will yes, definitely yeah. yeah because information and expertise is to be shared so we will share yeah, sure i don't have any i don't have any issue man yeah, yeah i don't have any problem excellent sir uh, i think uh, if they have uh, any more questions uh, they can share it with us tomorrow also we can ask uh, those questions yes. to you yes yes uh, sure. yeah then yeah. dr rajko shall we conclude today Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm yeah. happy if you, uh, there are no further questions. Dr. Rajkumar, your talk was so so exciting. It oh, appeared to be you. yeah, it appeared to be a journey for us, right? Uh, we just didn't feel that already one and a half hour just flew away from us. It was like a journey. You just uh, took us for a journey from micro world to uh, macro world. You started your talk with the cell and took us to the space. You yeah. explain physics applications in healthcare, energy production, and the latest uh, uh, trends of research in physics in the other areas, in other fields, especially particularly bio, biomedical fields. Everything uh, we really felt that we stood under the information fall. Thank, thanks a lot, ma'am. Really, really, our mind is filled with a lot of information. uh truly your talk presented an interdisciplinary approach and provided a lot of insights yeah generally yeah. uh, there is a saying a cow on the bank of a river finds the other bank is greenery uh, really we feel the same experience today uh, we teach physics uh, our own disciplines and uh, we try to have more and more understanding in our own subjects but today your talk uh, gave an opportunity to all of us to see the richness of other branches of study also how yeah. venkatraman ramakrishnan sir an indian physicist and molecular yeah. biologist got a uh, nobel prize for chemistry so interdisciplinary mm -hmm. approach is the most essential part of higher education today a physicist yeah. learning biology and obtaining nobel prize in uh, chemistry uh, it's really amazing achievement so i hope uh, your talk would have given lot of insights for uh, youngsters uh, to take up the insights and implement it in their area of work and really we are proud that an eminent youth who is doing post doctoral degree in germany is able to address us on this international youth day on abdul kalam sir's birthday it's a great coincidence and really we are proud of dr apj abdul kalam and we are re really proud to see our youth shining like this i hope your role model will inspire many of the youth who are attending this webinar and they will take up a leading role in the future and in this yeah. connection i would also like to inform that yesterday's speaker dr y s raf sir has announced a contest and we have shared with you we have shared in the three whatsapp groups he has come out with an idea that inspired to innovate and he has requested the participants maybe lecturers maybe scholars maybe students uh, if you have any idea which could bring a solution for a crucial problem of today if you could state and submit it to him the best five ideas you would consider and uh, he is ready to give mentoring for you to help you uh, throughout your research part or he is ready to offer internship uh, possibility for you or sometimes he would be providing scholarship also like feedback form they should not in a hurry go and fill up something and submit that uh, form it's idea it's, it should be really vibrant and uh, really nice so please think think and if you feel that you can bring uh, through some simple idea bring a solution means you share with some eminent people genuine people they will be with you and they will support you to bring your idea into your product so with this assurance 
we say that truly today's talk was interdisciplinary and inspired all of us on behalf of all the delegates who are present here i express our gratitude to dr rajkumar for keeping your work aside and sharing your expertise with us thank you so much we the department of physics members also take this opportunity to express our gratitude to all the delegates who are participating and who are with us thanks a lot have a nice evening we will meet tomorrow thank you one and all thank you yeah. thanks a lot thank from you. my side also and uh, my only main aim is even at least if one student is able to uh, excel okay. with regarding to my presentation i'll be more than happy and uh, this is what uh, i'm also trying to do inspire as many students as possible thanks a lot for the opportunity once again to maristella college and i'm yeah. open to others who wants me to present thanks a lot ma'am yeah.